the Eurofighter Typhoon. One of the most advanced fighter jets in the world, armed and ready. The pilots set to scramble at a moment's notice to defend the country on the orders of the British government. This is what order I've been given. This is my job. I am the weapons platform. For the first time, cameras have been allowed to film every stage of this vital part of national security. The worst case scenario is that we potentially have to shoot down uh, an aircraft. We have scrambled to QRA We have been inside the UK's top secret nuclear bunker and heard from the pilots themselves and the politicians who would give them the order to shoot down a plane. If you were a hostile aircraft, that's quite threatening. My target coming. In a matter of seconds, the Sky Defenders of the United Kingdom are away on what has now become a routine job, shooting down Nazis. Just as we were ready in 1940 for the Nazi aircraft coming across the southeast of England, then we're ready now. This is the story of how the RAF protects Britain's skies every minute of every day. RAF Coningsby in Lincolnshire is home to two frontline typhoon squadrons. 30 combat jets are based here. They are flown by 40 pilots and supported by 400 ground crew. They have many roles, but the one that never ends for them is a mission known as QRA. It stands for Quick Reaction Alert. the RAF's operation to protect the skies of Britain. On a discreet part of RAF Coningsby is a building nicknamed the Q Shed. It sits between two hangars. Inside each one is an aircraft loaded with fuel and missiles, ready to take off day or night. The pilots take it in turns on the QRA rotor. Each shift last 24 hours. They don't want us to broadcast their surnames for their own personal security. Just tell me what it's like, the, sort of the, the feelings when you're on shift and you're fairly tense because you don't know when that's going to crack up. Yeah, indeed. You can't, you can't think about it too much um, because otherwise you, your mind wouldn't be in the right place when, when you got the shout. Um, obviously, you've always got an ear on, ear on anything that, that, can, that can happen. On shift, the Q shed becomes home. There are bedrooms so they can sleep overnight, but on duty, their senses never fully switch off. Mark is coming to the end of his first shift, and it's been a quiet one. This is your first QRA? Yeah. What sort of feeling of responsibility do you have? Yeah, it's a, it's a huge feeling of responsibility. Um, it's, it's kind of nice to be able to kind of, kind of uh, fulfil the training that we've carried out for such a long period of time. Um, but yeah, there certainly is a... a a weight of responsibility, yeah. Why is it important for you to be doing this job? I think it's, a, as John said before, I think it's a real privilege um, to be in this position to protect the country as a whole. It's been a gentle introduction to QRA for Mark. Not every shift, though, is as quiet as this one. On average, 8,000 aircraft enter British airspace every single day. This animation shows the actual route of each plane during one typical 24-hour period last year. Whether they're landing, taking off, or just passing overhead, each aircraft must be closely monitored. It, it is quite a challenge, um, but our training um, and, and the practicing and the simulation that we do in terms of our operations uh, are fundamental to making sure that we achieve the tasks that we are assigned to do. We're identifying aircraft every day and we're looking for every aircraft that comes into the UK to understand where it's going, what it's doing. Um, but, but on occasions, um, on a daily basis, there are uh, instances where we are unsure of what the aircraft is doing or it might be in a different place to where we were expecting it or a different time. The British military has two air control and reporting centres, CRCs. One based at RAF Bulmer in Northumberland, and this one at RAF Scampton in Lincolnshire. 
just a few miles to the west of the Typhoon Station at RAF Coningsby. For security reasons, the various parts of the QRA operation are kept in different locations in case of attack. Their job here is to identify suspicious activity. They are looking for abnormal behavior, unusual flight paths, loss of communication, unidentified aircraft. As we are filming, an alert goes off. Okay, what we've got is we've had a uh, call on the guard radio. The guard radio is where every aircraft within the UK listens to that radio with air traffic going out for a, an aircraft who's not speaking to anyone at the moment. Every single aircraft in the UK? Every aircraft will listen in to guard the guard radio so that actually if they need to be contacted, they can be contacted. In this particular instance, um, an aircraft has got airborne out of Marham. Um, um, we believe it to have a, a, a stuck trunk, uh, receiver, which means he can't hear. Um, but we have not had him check in, so they've gone on guard radio to try and contact him to establish two-way communications with him and therefore be able to identify him and confirm which aircraft it is. It turns out to be a US Air Force plane with radio problems. Nothing to worry about. The Typhoon crews are stood down. We have two main uh, missions in respect of uh, quick reaction and alert. One is uh, against um, military aircraft um, and Russian aircraft. Um, and the other one is very much a UK-centric 9-11 um, type scenario. This is a Russian Bear aircraft. It's a long-range Tupolev bomber. Recently, Vladimir Putin has been using them to challenge NATO's response. How do you assess that current ge geopolitical situation with the Russians? Uh, well, uh, the first question is, uh, you know, go and speak to Mr. Putin and see what his intentions are. But I think the important thing from my viewpoint, we have a responsibility as, as a NATO member, uh, firstly, to reassure uh, those uh, member states that are much closer to any potential Russian threat than ourselves, that we are here, that uh, NATO is uh, fit for purpose, and of course, to deter, um, as part of NATO, any uh, potential aggressors uh, to the organisation and the countries within it. Only last Thursday, two RAF typhoons were scrambled from Lossiemouth in Scotland to intercept a Russian blackjack strategic bomber that is capable of flying supersonic. The Russian planes don't submit a flight plan or transmit their position. They never actually enter British airspace, but fly into the British area of interest to test the RAF's reactions. They're doing their job um, and uh, we're doing our job to determine what is happening and then feed that back to the uh, fighter controllers and further up the chain. In April 2015, a Russian bear bomber flew up the English Channel straight through busy commercial flight paths. This is video of that incident, filmed from inside the Russian plane, the RAF typhoons shadowing it alongside. This kind of flying is is extremely intimidatory. It's also dangerous. Um, they may not enter our airspace, but uh, they don't respond. They don't file flight plans. They don't respond to air traffic control. They don't even respond to our pilots when they're up in the air alongside them. It's unnecessary behavior. It's intimidatory. It's designed to, uh, uh, to annoy us, but uh, it's important we respond to it, and we do. In a matter of seconds, the sky defenders of the United Kingdom are away on what has now become a routine job. Shooting down Nazis. 75 years ago, the men and women of the RAF were performing a very similar role, but against a very different enemy. Goering's Luftwaffe took its first licking. In 1940, the German Luftwaffe was bombing airfields across the southeast of England. The only thing that stood in their way were the hurricanes and spitfires of fighter command. It was the Battle of Britain. Well, this is rather a large part of British history. And if it wasn't for the replica hurricane and a Spitfire as well, you wouldn't know it's here. You could almost walk straight past it. Because 76 stairs below here is a World War II underground operations room, which was the command center for the Battle of Britain. During those tense days, this bunker at RAF Uxbridge was manned round the clock as the Nazis pummeled the airfields in the southeast. Key decisions that would decide the fate of Europe were taken here 
60 feet underground. It's extraordinary to think that just 70 years ago, this was very much the height of technology. And try and imagine what it must have been like during those days. There would have been 20 people crowded around this table, all of them women, working in pairs, plotting the route of German aircraft as they came across the English Channel. One RAF officer said it was like a game of tennis. The Germans were always serving. The RAF were the ones returning. And on that day, that crucial day, as if to add to the pressure, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister, was up here watching down and he saw on the board behind all of the lights turn red, meaning that every single Spitfire and Hurricane Squadron was up in the air engaging the Germans. And he turned to the man in charge and said, how much have we got in reserve? The answer came back, none. Fighter command was vastly outnumbered. The Luftwaffe came at them with over 3,000 aircraft. The Allies only had 600 in the beginning. Fighter command lost 103 pilots killed, 128 seriously injured. Uh, the lifeblood of fighter command, its fighter pilots, was ebbing away. Um, so we were in a pretty serious state. We had pilots, we didn't have combat trained pilots, and pilots were arriving at frontline squadrons, if they were lucky, with 20 hours of experience on a Hurricane or a Spitfire, some with 15, some with 10, some with none at all. The Hurricane might have shot down more planes in the battle, but the Spitfire has become a British icon. Well, this is the last remaining airworthy Spitfire to have fought in the Battle of Britain. And the RAF bought it for £25 off a scrap heap back in 1948, would you believe it? It's not particularly comfortable, I have to say, and to imagine that these young men would go up in it four or five times a day to face the Germans over the English Channel is, is quite something. Today, the home of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight is RAF Coningsby. The planes that defended Britain's skies 75 years ago now live alongside their modern successors, the Typhoons. There are a few RAF pilots who get to fly both. One of those is Coningsby's station commander, Group Captain Jez Attridge. These old aeroplanes, you can really feel them. You know, you're, there's not much to them. It's you and the stick. Whereas the modern aeroplanes, it's all about processing the information rather than actually flying the aeroplane. So you're sitting there as a battle space manager rather than a pure pilot. Like the Spitfire and the Hurricane, the Typhoon was designed for a dogfight. It was built to shoot down the enemy. From their Lincolnshire base, they can be over central London in just 10 minutes. When the alarm goes, there is no time for a briefing. Coming up, the siren sounds. You all right? The siren goes off and we need to be out of those aircraft as soon as possible. The training just kicks in and the adrenaline flows. And we experience firsthand what it is like to be intercepted at 35,000 feet. If you do not respond immediately to my orders at Turkey, you will be shot down. During the later years of the Cold War, when the Russian nuclear threat was at its height, the British government built this bunker at RAF Air Command outside High Wycombe in Buckinghamshire. It is so top secret that this is the first time cameras have been allowed to film it. Three sets of blast doors protect it from nuclear, biological and chemical attack. There are four floors going deep below the ground. On the second, somewhere in the heart of the bunker, is the National Air Defence Operations Centre, the NADOC, the top of the military chain to protect Britain's skies. Michael, this is the MC for the NAT rep. We still have no radio contact with... The role of the NADOC is to act very much as the hub, the fusion point, if you want, for, for all the information that comes in to allow us to exercise air defence on behalf of the United Kingdom Air Defence Command. Just what, we've got a lost comms on a call sign. If a suspicious aircraft appears, there is a direct line from here to the Department of Transport and the Metropolitan Police Counter-Terror Unit. They can swap intelligence to build a clearer picture of the threat. In real emergencies, a red phone connects straight to Downing Street. When dialed, a voice answers with one simple word, London. It is then transferred to the Prime Minister or to a senior cabinet minister if he is away.
Imagine when the phone rings, even during an exercise, the heart beats a little faster. Yes, you know, there are, there are lives at stake, there are uncertainties, you're unsure as to whether how real the threat uh, is, and uh, there's advice available to you, but in the end, uh, a minister has to take that decision. The QRA operation is highly sensitive. It has never been filmed before, from start to finish. But the RAF gave us unprecedented access to do just that. This is how it works. We flew out of RAF Coningsby to play the part of a hijacked passenger plane. So we've been heading east over the North Sea. We're about there at the moment. And in a minute we're going to turn around, we're going to start coming back down towards the UK, but this time it's an unidentified aircraft, at which point the alarm bells will start ringing, the typhoons based here in Coningsby will be scrambled, and they will come out, sit alongside us, and intercept us. At RAF Scampton, our aircraft is identified on the computer screens. Chuck of interest, East Coast inbound. They immediately contact the NADOC in the bunker at RAF Air Command. Matt Rep, good morning, sir. This is the master controller. I have a track of interest in the system for you. Zulu Zulu 001. He's east coast heading northwest right now at 35,000 feet. Yeah, I can see it on your radar. Roger, that's understood. I will be quick reaction alert to readiness. Stand by. The master controller at Scampton alerts the typhoons. Coningsby Operations and QRA. This is the Black Dog master controller. Acknowledge. QRA. Q on. Four quick reaction alerts. Scramble, scramble, scramble at knowledge. You're right. The two pilots and their ground teams run to the hangars. They can flick a switch to begin powering up the jet even as they climb into the cockpit. The typhoons are clear to take off. We have scrambled two QRA jets to intercept this lost calm zone first. One jet has been cleared to the sun. Climb flight level four, one zero and four zero zero. Set speed initially decimal and nine. Your mission interrogate. As they break through the clouds, any other information that we got on this aircraft? the team on the ground are still trying to gather intelligence on the suspect aircraft. He's still out of radio contact with air traffic control. The typhoons need to reach it fast and assess the situation for themselves. The quicker they get there, the more thinking time for the Prime Minister if he is called upon to make a decision. And it can happen. We start with uh, breaking news tonight as a Russian-built Latvian cargo plane has been intercepted by RAF typhoons and escorted into Stansted Airport. The military... In October 2014, the typhoons from RAF Coningsby flew supersonic to intercept a Latvian aircraft approaching London. It wasn't communicating, and so the RAF pilot gave this final warning. 1605 from the Lima 9 Tango 47. I'm instructed by Her Majesty's Government of the United Kingdom to warn you that if you do not respond immediately to my orders, you will be shot down. The cargo plane was safely escorted into Stansted. It is one of the UK's designated airports for terrorist incidents. The people in the cockpit, the people communicating with the cockpit, are fully trained, fully rehearsed, and ready for that moment. Back at RAF Coningsby, even as the two typhoons are closing in on our target aircraft, New jets are being readied should another call come in. The pilot inspects the weapons and does his pre-flight checks in the cockpit. If the sirens sound, everything must be ready to go. Although there is another QRA base at RAF Lossiemouth in Scotland, Coningsby must be set to launch any time of day or night, even if some of its aircraft are already deployed. 30,000 feet above the North Sea, the typhoons are closing in on our aircraft. They approach cautiously, in case they spook the plane. And then they try to contact the cockpit. Russian 66 from Q2, intercept our aircraft. Our aircraft doesn't respond. Q2, Black Dog, confirm no response. The 
it's remarkable how close they get. There's one either side of us at the moment, both fully armed. If you were a hostile aircraft, that's quite threatening. The Typhoon pilots will report what they're seeing back to the ground and in turn receive any new intelligence. Change heading onto east immediately at large. So that they can stay on station for as long as needed, a refueling tanker is deployed. They will be getting um, communications from the control and reporting centres at Scampton and, and Bulmer. They'll be giving us instructions um, as more information is fed to them and they gain more information from, from other sources. And then gradually there's an escalation process if that needs to occur. There's nothing new in there that we don't practice and the training just kicks in and the adrenaline, the adrenaline flows. Having no luck with radio contact, the Typhoon pilots fire flares as a show of force. By now, most options have been tried and our plane is still not responding. It has become a real threat to national security. I am instructed by Her Majesty's Government of the United Kingdom to warn you that if you do not respond immediately to my orders to turn east, you will be shot down. It is probable that were this happening for real, the Prime Minister or a senior cabinet member would now be on the line and brief. The worst case scenario is that we potentially have to shoot down uh, an aircraft, but that's having gone through the most robust processes and procedures in order to identify and interrogate that aircraft. And who would make that decision? That decision is held at the political level, at the highest political level. But who would give the order to the pilot? The orders would be issued by my team. Are they trained for that? Absolutely, and they're ready to do that. Would you be prepared to shoot down a commercial airliner? At the end of the day, we're in the military. This is our job 24-7, 365 days, days a year. So um, if that's an order given to us and the correct protocols have been followed, the correct authentications be given, then yes, we, we can't think about it. It's our job. Does uh, it go it's through an order. Line? It will when I land. It won't airborne. The typhoons have returned to Coningsby. Another day on quick reaction alert. Their mission is over, their shift isn't. They go back on standby, ready should the alarm go again. In 1940, the young men and women of Fighter Command protected Britain's skies against Nazi invasion. Today, 75 years on, Russian aircraft continue to probe NATO's air defences, and the threat of terrorism is as high as it has been for many years. Everyone knows their part in that system, they train for it, they rehearse for it, and so then if an event happens, then they're ready to react. Training kicks in, this is what I've been trained to do, this is what order I've been given, this is my job. Every pilot, engineer and controller is aware of the part that they play, keeping the country safe, protecting Britain's skies every minute of every day.